Where are you going? What? Where are you going? I'm going to the Mega Place. Okay, alright, cool. Um, see you there. This is Ed Scott. I predict he's gonna win style. Welcome back to another episode of Unlocked. I've had three hours sleep. I'm full of Tim Hortons. I'm in Vancouver. Every time I come to Vancouver, my dad is like, you have to go out hiking, you have to see the sights. I've got family here that I've never met. He's always telling me to go and visit them. I'm not going to. I'm gonna spend the next three days in this building on top of a bingo hall, witnessing the North American Hardcore Championships, and I cannot wait. To the outside world, most of what we see from NAPC focuses on the athletic feats of the competitors. But I wanted to look into what goes on behind the scenes of the competition, and how Origins Parkour, along with a few volunteers, keep the event running so smoothly. It seems very relaxed around here. <laughs> Since the inception of NAPC seven years ago, Origins have grown it from a single event, predominantly attended by locals, to the most important competition circuit in parkour. Seven regional qualifying events, culminating with a final in Vancouver, make up the Sport Parkour League, which now attracts hundreds of competitors from around the world. This growth is no small feat, and one that is only reached through perseverance along with the ability to listen and adapt to the community of our ever-evolving sport. In the days leading up to the final, I wanted to spend time with the organisers to really find out what goes on behind the scenes. When I arrived, I was surprised to find a lack of energy, in a very literal sense. <laughs> My landlords told me months ago that there was a bunch of work that needed to be done on 70 year old electrical stuff in the building, because we're a three story building. And I told them not to do it this week. They're doing it this week. So we don't have power until tomorrow afternoon, right before the event. And so we literally have to do all of the event prep this year in the dark. While electrical engineers worked outside against the clock, I was curious to see how Renee and Tom were feeling about an integral part of the competition, the course design. Everything is already planned, uh, unlike last year. <laughs> last year I would have been still figuring stuff out. Uh, we're taking apart this setup so that we can repurpose these structures for the event. So how do you plan out the courses without putting the boxes there in the first place to know like scale and things? Brain. Given that you, like, you are not Tim Champion, how do you know confidently to sort of set things, especially for skill, I think? The majority of the challenges that we set for skill are using the structures that are permanent. Like this in particular is being moved because of speed. You can ask your boys, this is the stickiest grip in parkour, right here. So why are you painting the bars last minute? <laughs> so I have wanted to paint the bars for months, but because the paint has a long dry time, it takes over a day to dry, uh, it's easier to do when no one's in the gym. So we are currently on our way to the Origins Port Moody gym. It's a gym I've never been to before. They've had it for a year or two now. It's definitely a much smaller gym. But this year they've chosen to hold the qualifying round for all the events there. After this happens, we've then got to rush back to the main gym. Hopefully they've then switched the power back on and that's when the main event starts. After a hectic scramble to get everything organised, all the athletes hoping to compete were then allowed into the gym. Up first was skill, where competitors had just 25 minutes to take on nine challenges. judges at each station where the skills are. When the athletes complete it, we give them a sign off just so that they can move on to the next one. So 
men and women's skill qualifier has just finished. Women's went really well. With the men's, there was a lot of people there. Like, it was hectically busy. You only had half an hour to complete as many challenges as possible. Personally, I feel like maybe they should have extended the time limit, but I can also see how for the organizers, it's hard to gauge this kind of thing. They want most people to sign up online, but parkour heads, they like to just turn up at the door, which meant that there was a huge influx of people last minute. They couldn't really change the time limits. And I feel like some people potentially missed out on potentially qualifying, but they have five qualifiers. People are going through, so I'm excited to see how it goes. as many force clients as possible because there's like way too many guys like ride on jumping and particularly when you look at shit like the big courses it's all it's all jumpy it's all strategy jumping it's not good After a few hours of stacked speed and style qualifiers, the results were in and a handful of competitors were making it through to the main comp. We then rushed back across the city to begin the quarterfinals. Stop fucking filming me. This is also the point where I deleted all of the footage from the quarterfinals, and I'm not really sure how, but we're going to skip straight to the semis. Wrong. Uh, right now I'm calling out athlete names. Get some pretty boys. Facilitating athlete headshots. Some things like in Photoshop. I'm gonna make a couple mouse pads for people, you know? <laughs> After booting the competitors from the gym and not content with the previous day's work, Renee and Tom set about making some final adjustments to the course. You design prior and then fine tune on the day. We fine tune on the day, especially today because on the first day we saw what the athletes were doing and we wanted to fine tune the course to make sure that it's hard enough but also shows a lot of variability. Again, just to keep in, just as a visual to keep in mind when we're designing speed courses, we get a lot of variability and then we force the action. A lot of variability, force the action. Are we doing one flag on the, like, can they go around? Hendo's here. Don't say anything. Oh. Cheater! Cheater, we caught you! After some much needed time for the athletes to prepare and abuse this year's hottest rehab trend, the doors were open and the gym was filling up with spectators keen to witness the evening's events. As the skill semi-finals got underway, I reflected back to a conversation I had had with Tom regarding how to ensure a balance when it came to power and control. We want to make sure that skill is not just an output contest. There's of course like if you have like a really powerful jump or a powerful lache or whatever, those are going to be assets in the competition, but ultimately you have to still be able to like land well. You still have to be able to like deal with really precise surfaces and be a well-rounded athlete. For Tom and Renee, it's only now, as the speed comp gets underway, that they can see whether their route planning truly delivers with regards to their pursuit of variable path choices and key moments of action. As is the competitive nature of these events, there will always be elements of controversy surrounding rules and decision making. These have to be handled swiftly and with confidence to ensure the event runs efficiently, but also in a way in which those affected feel a fair decision has been made. This incident brought to light a common confusion often seen at speed events. Do the flags represent a vertical pole where the whole body must pass to one side? Or more of a checkpoint with looser restrictions with regards to its boundaries?
Gender equality and equal prize pools have been a growing topic surrounding parkour competitions over the last few years. I wanted to hear Origin's standpoint on the matters, given the scale and impact of the Sport Parkour League. It's been our mission this year to include as many women as we can, which is why we accepted the top three women from every qualifier that we've hosted all year. Because there's such a small athlete pool to pull from, that means we get fewer female athlete participation in the events, which means we have less revenue coming from women athletes. It's an economic game at that point, so we actually don't offer equal prize money to women. In the past, the Sport Parkour League has faced criticism for restricting their style courses to smaller, sometimes more limited areas of the gym, a decision which some argue has cost worthy competitors a place in later stages of the competition. In past years, we've definitely been more restrictive with style courses because we wanted to really force lines to happen. As we've kind of progressed through the years, we've actually started taking away some of those restrictions because athletes are getting better, they're understanding our format a little bit better, they understand what it means to create a line. We're trying to allow that freedom to sort of take place so that they can put together their line. After a night of what is apparently now becoming an annual tradition of drinking too much and terrible karaoke, I arrived at the gym to find the organisers once again rearranging the skill challenges. Why are the challenges being made significantly different from what was proposed yesterday? Um, it's a combination of a few things. So some of them were deemed a little bit too easy. In fact, one of them included a 180 that Brody came in and did as a warm-up. So we're like, oh, that 180 is not big enough, okay. And then the other one was really good, like technically wise, but I think visually might not come across so well to the people watching it online. So they're changing it to make it look better. It's an interesting perspective to consider in this social media driven world, the way challenges look on Instagram could be a huge factor in the design of a competition. <laughs> it's not that Origins are specifically looking to create viral content. However, if a challenge looks aesthetic and is easily comprehensible by somebody watching on their phone, this is drastically going to increase the clip's shareability. It just makes sense to design with this in mind. One area where this event excels is in providing adequate practice time for the athletes. While the skill category has no prep time, as the challenges are presented to the athletes live, the speed and style athletes are provided with a restricted but fair amount of time to prepare their lines. I've witnessed other events in our sport where athletes are given incredibly short windows to prepare, often while the course is packed full of other categories' competitors, or even worse, non-competitors. Preparation time is hugely important, not only so that athletes can perform to their highest level, but most importantly to ensure safety. This is most evident in the prep time for the highly anticipated Big Trick category. final rounds take place, it's almost impossible to shift your focus from what's going on at the centre of the gym. After all, it's what you're supposed to be watching. 
parkour's best athletes, going head to head, pushing themselves to their physical and mental limits. However, none of this would be possible without the hard work and determination of a small group of individuals found dotted around the room, more focused on keeping things running. It's taken years of adjustments and format changes to get it where it is now, and I'm sure there are more improvements to come. However, year on year, this competition and others like it are growing, laying down the foundations that make the once impossible dream of a truly professional competitive athlete within parkour seem more and more viable. With so many parallels drawn between other action sports like skateboarding and BMX, where competition winners walk away with hundreds of thousands of dollars and global recognition, is it too much to believe that if we continue to support events like the Sport Parkour League, we also could one day be at that level?